Welcome back, everyone. So today's podcast episode is another interview with an investor here in Denver. As you guys know, over the last few weeks, we've been interviewing a lot of the book contributors in the 2020 guide and just got us thinking and talking to other investors here in Denver. And uh, I got Terrence Doyle in here as a guest host again. And Terrence, this is one of your buddies that we're interviewing today. That's right. Yeah. One of my very close friends I've known since college and really excited to have him on. He was actually on the ride along show as well and uh, excited to have him here for an interview. What's up? Kalena as a Buki. That's me. Good to be here. What's happening? Glad to have you here, man. Yeah. So you and I have known each other for a long time. True. And we've talked about real estate. I think the first real estate conversation we had, I was telling Chris was you're in your first year in the NBA we were at our favorite restaurant in the Bay, and I was telling you guys about foreclosures. Yeah. You remember that conversation? Yeah, I do. I do. That was a good conversation. I, I, it definitely sparked my interest. I mean, it's a tangible asset, and people always need a place to live. So I was like, this makes sense. That's right. That's right. So fast forward 10 years, and now you're walking a multifamily property that we had in Aurora. Mm -hmm. We had you and John Johnson out there to check it out. Beeler. Beeler Street. That's right. Yep. So what... Uh, what stood out from that uh, from that walkthrough? I I remember you did your homework. I could tell you did your due diligence, and, and there's a lot of moving parts. And we were talking about multifamily and my interest in that, and I definitely came to the conclusion around that time that it's probably not my personality to to bring it to the point where it's turnkey. Right. It's more my personality to get in. When it's ready, it's turnkey, it's passive income, maybe get a property manager, they take care they take care of it. But um I, I did I do like the way uh you made sure you knew exactly what the plan was going forward, right. what walls you were gonna knock down, what you're gonna do with the bathroom, the kitchen, the transformation. And that's your personality. You like being <laughs> hands on and the before and after pictures and all that stuff. And and that's great. That's great. I love I love that passion and the fact that you're able to do. That. I think that's what your investors love about you. Right. You're really hands on, and you got a team, and and there's a rhythm there. You get you've gotten into a rhythm. So it was a really interesting property. There, there was I feel like there was a lot that you guys were going to do that was pre construction, and you guys had it all figured out, and and it was impressive. It was definitely impressive. That's cool. I appreciate that. So, you know, one of the things, you know, a lot of listeners that don't know you, why don't you give them a, a little bit of your background, you know, kind of what you what you did in your first career and then kind of what you're doing now and why, you know, you've chosen to get into real estate. Well, yeah, I, I got into real estate probably, I guess it was 09, but I grew up playing basketball, ended up going to college, Kentucky, entered the NBA in 07, and had a solid career. It got cut short, but 09 while I was still playing basketball was when I kind of just started to dive into real estate. And we started with single family properties right. and fix and flips for the most part. And again, I, I Were come you doing back those to, here in Denver. Yes. Or, okay. For the most part, Lakewood, Littleton, Pueblo, some other areas, but it, for the most part, it's a good experience. I made some money. And at first I was kind of an absentee investor. And then I started, kind of getting more involved and reading up on it and, and figuring out exactly what's going on. And I never really dealt with contractors and all that and got that hands on, but I started figuring out what, what was happening there. And with fix and flips, it can be a, a great, a great experience, but you learn, you got to make sure you have a good inspector, figure out what the budget is. A lot of times you go over budget there can be unforeseen issues, foundation, electric, plumbing, all these different things that pop up. And that's the part where I was like, you know what? I think I'd rather let someone else handle this right. and then look for properties that are turnkey, that are ready to, to rent out. The buy and holds is kind of where I kind of found that my personality fit best. Right. And just being able to get into something, know exactly whatever the cap rate is and figuring out what the rents are going to be and going from there and just building up that passive income. I'm about that passive paper. You feel That's me? Right. Mailbox money. Yeah. So, but the, the fix and flips were fun and you, you kind of learn a lot about the real estate 
industry and 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 trying to figure out how to to get a good team around you and and get into a rhythm that way and make sure everybody's doing their part and dealing with the contractors and making sure you find a, a good some good contractors that are going to do the job well and for a reasonable price and knowing what's modern and what people like and colors and all these different things. I was like, I'm, I'm not with all that, especially playing basketball. I don't have time to deal with all that. And, and the same thing now, especially during the season, I'm not going to be able to be on the, on the phone with, with contractors and going and, and riding around and checking out all these properties and making sure everything's on the up and up. So let me, I'm curious, how were you, while you're playing the NBA, how are you managing these fix and flips? Like, how are you, Take so them down, man. I had a little team. It was kind of a family thing at okay. first. My mom was in it. My brother was in it. My mom and brother were the ones dealing with the contractors. We would find properties, bank owned, foreclosures. I think we got some off auctions. And so they did a good job. They did a good job. But we we definitely learned some lessons along the way, making sure you have a good inspector, making sure you know all the issues before you get into it. You don't want to go over budget too much. The big profits are great. It's just the the coming, the 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 transformation part and making sure the repair is actually what you budgeted for, and making sure you don't go too much over there. We tried to stay around hundred k to two hundred k around there, getting in, and then the repairs, making sure we crunched the numbers and and we liked our profits after that. But it's it's. If you know what you're doing, it's a lot of fun. But again, it's I just don't think it's my personality. I, and it's funny too cuz I'm I'm a creative. I love to create things. I love making beats. I love seeing what I can make out of nothing. But just just being able to to take that much time, spend that much time on the phone and 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 keeping up with what's trendy right now, what's in, what people like, what what colors for cabinets and and making sure the houses is open, making sure what walls people need to knock down and all those different things was just a little more than I probably have time for right now. But it's cool watching, seeing what you do and seeing the before and after pictures and all those different things and and going, okay, yeah, they did a great job. I, I, I like how they came out. But for me, I'm more on the the other side of it. Once you bring it up to speed, there. Once you bring it up to the part, the point where it's turnkey, and you can just throw money at it and know exactly what your rent's going to be, and that's kind of where I'm at now. So, how how long were you fixing flipping for, and when did you move more to like the the rental uh, passive side? I would say I was fixing and flipping for. I mean, it was like oh nine to fourteen. Okay. Maybe. So it was a so it's a it's a good run. Oh yeah, it's a good run. And and some of those fix and flips, I think there was a few of them where we we did the repair, and we felt like the best option was to go ahead and just rent it out. So just just hold on to it. So it just depended on what the situation was, what the numbers looked like. We'd crunch the numbers and figure out what's best, but just building up that that real estate portfolio when it comes to that passive income was kind of what I was transitioning into and it's kind of where I'm at now but the the fix and flips it, it was fun it was fun for the most part and there was some <laughs> there was some projects where you're like okay now we're just trying to break even this is crazy I think the one of the things that you're talking to uh speaking to as far as the all the moving parts is just managing construction that didn't fit your personality because I know that, you know, having to deal with con contractors and negotiate and having people go overboard or having people not even show up or, right. you know, having to bail them out of jail and just all the things that come along with construction. <laughs> I never had to bail anyone out of jail. I think Zoe <laughs> and I about talked that. about one of your plumbers, I think was, oh, I had to call, yeah, so yeah. I don't know. But anyways, <laughs> the, the point is we've, you know, dealing with construction is a full contact sport yeah. and with you having a really, you know, full-time career that you have to be devoted to when you were playing and then now on the broadcasting side. It just doesn't fit your lifestyle. And I think, you know, one of the great things that I've seen you do is just kind of adapt and and pivot, you know, and when you realize that, hey, this is not something I can really, I can do and be a good steward of my money doing this because right. of managing construction is so full-time that you pivoted to some other things. Now, I want to get back to some of the lessons you learned, but talk about some of the other deals you've done because I know you and your family have done really well on some new development stuff buying before a neighborhood has been developed and then also Airbnb. So you want to talk about some of those, some of the successes you've had on. Yeah. The new builds 
love the new bills because you get in as low as possible and they're going to do nothing but go up in price. So we, we've got into some new bills. I've done some. But tell us how you did that, though. You guys, like in the one in Littleton, I know, we knew that neighborhood. Yeah. And then Are you, you saw- talking like new, like brand new subdivisions, like new build communities? It was a new community okay. and they would get in. Tell us how you guys did it. Yeah. Well, just really it was, it was Michelle. Uh, Mom was involved a little bit, but Michelle was always up on where, where new developments were, were going to come up and we're going to start up. So she kind of got the inside scoop on that. She's got a real estate license. So we would just get in, be one of the first ones in and got a good amount of those properties. And we would just get out when the price went up a pretty good amount and got a good profit that way. So it, it was, it was really profitable. And were we you buying that. and like renting them for a while or were you just, we didn't really rent out. Yeah, I actually, yeah, I, I did rent out a couple of them, but for the most part, we just got out and cause I'm in a new build now, the one, the one I live in now. And it's kind of the same way you just get in, it's a sizable house. And then, a few years in, you move out and make a profit on the old one and get a bigger one. So it's it was a pretty profitable pretty profitable venture there, and we enjoyed that. And the you upside know. was you didn't have to deal with construction. So right. it's still kind of like exactly. a different way of doing a flip because what I, what I remember is you guys were buying like one of the first spec homes in a development, yeah. and you guys would get in at the bottom floor level, and then every year as they release new homes, the prices would go up 10%, 20%, and by the time the development, the entire neighborhood was finished, you guys had made 20 or 30% yeah. by just buying early yeah. and, the rest of the, and the rest of the neighborhood being developed. So I really, you know, I'd, I never had, the, I didn't even know that there was an opportunity like that, and I'd never seen anyone do it, but your family's done it pretty consistently in Denver and done it and with, with some great success. Yeah. We're just thinking about getting in low, selling high basically and new developments. Obviously people are going to continue to move in. The price is going to go up, especially in Denver. It's just the, the prices, the market just keeps going up there. So we just decided to get in with the new builds and there's, there's no maintenance issues. There's no foundation right. issues. There's no, there's no problems there. You know, it's a, it's a brand new house and you get in an incredible price and then, you wait a little bit and the price goes up, whether it's a year, a couple of years, whatever, and you make a good profit that way. So just, just getting creative. I don't know if that's being creative, but we just saw an opportunity there with, with some developments. And there's, that's one thing about Denver. There's so many really cool places to live and there's, there's always seems to be new developments going up. So we, we looked for those opportunities and, and capitalized on them. It's kind of a new spin on a house hack, Chris. Without having to do the construction, you get in early. And that's kind of what I what I uh, kind of took away from seeing you guys do that. And yeah, and like your new development, I remember going to see it and you were like one of the first houses on the block. And now the whole yeah. you know, the whole neighborhood's been done and it looks really good. It's almost like buying a distressed house without the distress part. I mean, you get in at that kind of price mm. in, a, in a lot of these places and you don't have to do a repair. So you just kind of... Give me like a basic number spread, like one of the properties you bought. I don't know if you can, because this is... Um, I mean, like the Littleton, the, one the Littleton was like 450 and you bought um, that about 450 in and it was the first one. It was the first one and it ended up selling for seven, seven, seven eighty. I think it was seven, something like that. Three or, years later. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was two years later. Two years. Wow. So you put, did so you have to put 20% those, down on that or did they have a builder special or how, what was the financing? It like? was like 20% down. Yeah. Okay. So you yeah. put 20% down on 450. Yeah. So you're in it for roughly a hundred, yeah. And then you sold it for seven fifty, yeah. And were you living in this one? It's just a straight investment. So there was there was one I was living in, and okay. then there was other ones we did. And then, and then there's just, Green Valley Ranch. Yeah, we got into some out there, and they're still building out there. I think. Oh but, yeah. And are you holding those as a rental, or what are you guys doing with the Green Valley Ranch? We've sold we sold off some of those, so. Yeah, then the rentals oh, have some rentals in Pueblo and still some in Lakewood, but. The new builds, the numbers are always really good when you get out. That's pretty impressive. Because they go up yeah. right away. I mean, it's... So you made roughly, what, $300,000, didn't have to do really any maintenance, manage right. any construction. Right. And you had a brand new house to live in that had warrantied work. Yeah. And then you just I mean, like... It's a good investment. If I mean, if if you want to get in something like that and, and rent it out, the rents will continue to go up too. But it just depends on what your strategy is. 
And I'm curious, when you exit, are you 1031 money into other properties, or are you just taking your chips off the yeah, table? Yeah, with the, with the house you live in, you get a 1031 exchange and all that stuff. Yeah. Make sure you're you're legal there. So you're doing all that but, and just rolling to like other new builds or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the one was his primary, so it was just tax-free. Yeah. Well, that, okay. One, was, sold that, yeah. Yeah, one of them was. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, it's if, if it's an investment strategy there, you want to get in and just, you know, sell off once you feel like it's come up a good amount. I just can't believe that strategy. increase. Though. That's insane. Yeah. Well, that's because it was the first house. So the it's like when house. everything else is dirt yeah. Yeah. and then you have one house and then everything else is dirt. They got that pricing. Yeah. And then I mean, we looked months later and houses were selling for like a hundred thousand more than what we got in. Mm. Like we were literally just phase one. It was basically yeah, phase one phase of the new one. development. If you yeah. get in phase one. And that was what Michelle was really good at is she knew how, because yeah. there's only like four or five houses that are really included in phase one. Exactly. And then yeah. every four or five, they kind of increase it. But yeah, we yeah, got she, in like, when knew. it was just dirt, yeah. you know? So, so it's kind of a twist on the house act, which is what I thought was pretty interesting because that's what everybody in Denver is looking for is how do I get into something and uh, at a low basis can live in it, rent out some other rooms, and then in a couple years move on. And, yeah. And that's, I think you guys kind of uncovered an interesting yeah. little nugget there. And then the Airbnb thing is is cool too. It's just a different solution for for people coming in town that are just going to be there for a short time. They don't want to stay in a hotel. Maybe they got a bigger family, especially the, like the bigger houses. Right. Like I found like a lot of the people that were Airbnb in my house wa- were, you know, families that had four or five people or six people and just a, a hotel room didn't make sense. Yep. And they'd have to get multiple hotel rooms or they just come in and, and Airbnb my house for a pretty good price. That's where you're getting there, four or 500 a night? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. About 400 a night, depending on if it's winter goes down in the winter and then summer, it's amazing. So yeah, that, that was, that was pretty cool too. And we got some, some apartments on, on Airbnb too. And just once you get to that, that what's it called? The super host status, (laughs) you throw some more, throw some more properties on there and you know, they do really well too. So that's been cool. That's been a cool little business, and it, it depends if you want to have, like, a property manager there, too. You can just have someone just make sure and take care of everything, or you could just do it yourself. How do you manage? So, for me, I, I actually was doing it myself. It's kind of fun, actually, just because I have— You were have doing this, it from Oakland? From Oakland, yeah. Oh. And I had a cleaner that I really trusted, and, you know, she would come and make sure she's, like, my inspector. So, <laughs> she inspects right before the, the guest comes in. And then as soon as the guest leaves, she's making sure that everything looks the same. There's nothing stolen. She's amazing at that. So I, and then I had the, the Igloo Homes lock thing where you can just yep. put a code in and, and open it from Oakland or from San Francisco. So that was pretty cool too. And then I had my mom too. My mom was, was close to the apartment complexes where I had the Airbnb. So she would, if I didn't have the Igloo Homes, she would go let the, the, the guests in and make sure they're good. And then she'd kind of manage it that way and she'd get a little percentage. Mm. So it's cool. That is really cool. So let's change gears a little bit. Cause I think most people don't know some of the ups and downs you've had throughout your career. And I think it's pretty inspirational. And I think especially living in this post COVID, or if you want to look at it in the middle of COVID world where, you know, some people have lost their small businesses or their careers have ended or they're coming to an end and, you know, a lot of people have gone through some pretty rough times the last 90 days. And, uh, and most people probably don't know the hard times you've been through. You know, I think from dealing with a career ending injury to, you know, after you'd played going back to college to get your degree and, and having no job and then working your way up from the bottom. And I think, you know, it's, there's some really good principles in there for people to glean from and that they can apply right now. Cause I think right now, a lot of people could be looking at their career and saying, man, I don't know what to do, mm-hmm. you know, because of COVID, I can't do what I used to do at the restaurant or do what I used to do at the, at the salon or a host of other industries. And, uh, I think, I think, uh, I think it could be pretty beneficial for people to hear kind of some of the things you've been through, some of the hard times and how you've been able to come out and pivot, you know, from in the middle of your prime or your career to basically having to figure out what to do next. Yeah. I had a, a career ending injury when I was on the rise. My, my career was trending in the right direction. I was, probably going to opt out the next season and and sign a really big deal and I tore my patella tendon and I'm sitting on the ground with my kneecap 
in my quad just going for those of you that aren't science majors, that's not where your that's not where your quad, to be. Yeah, that's not where your kneecap that's should not be. Not the correct place. My patella tendon was was done for, and so I'm sitting there going, "Okay, what's going to happen with the rest of my career?" My career was flashing before my eyes, and so I threw everything at it. I had one surgery where the doctor, the the surgeon, screwed up, and he just kind of sewed up the tendon where he should have added a cadaver graft, and made it to where the tendon can heal without there being tension on the the healing tendon because my quad is so strong and it's still pulling on my kneecap so my tendon needed to heal and not have to pull the kneecap mm -hmm. down it just needs to heal and have no tension on it but this I, I was gonna call him a bad name but this surgeon I guess he's done it this way before and he said it it worked for these other people he did it for wow. but now knowing what I know now it doesn't make sense doing it that way so he just sewed it up and my kneecap he didn't even pull my kneecap all the way down where it should have been in the first place then he just sewed up my tendon and my kneecap ended up back in my quad and so wow. don nelson calls me while i'm supposed to be rehabbing i'm supposed to be farther along than i am he calls me he's like hey we're gonna need you next year you're the guy i'm depending on you you're probably gonna be a leading scorer how are you coming along are you running yet and I'm like, well, I'm doing great, coach. I'm doing great. I'm not, I'm not running yet. You know, I mean, I'm not running yet. And the explosiveness isn't back yet, but I'm coming. I'm coming along. And and I could tell the tone of his voice just kind of changed. He's like, you're not running yet, really? Uh, and I'm like, no, I'm not running yet, but I'm coming. I'm coming. And so, you know, it's he tried to kind of put on a good face and and sound optimistic, but I could tell he was just like, man, this dude. I don't think this is going to work out. His injury is probably worse than we thought and and so after that call I think it was like two days later they traded me Jeez. to the Knicks and the Knicks were hoping I was going to get back to what I was they had wanted to get me before Mike D'Antoni so their training staff looked at me and they're like this is worse than we thought the physical was bad and Somehow the trade went through, but they're like, man, you're at a mechanical disadvantage. Your kneecap is not supposed to be there. So basically my my leg would bend and my kneecap would just stay here on top of my top of my leg where it's supposed to kind of go down yeah. right. with the leg. And so that was just my tendon stretching, and that's what this first surgeon had done to me, screwed it up. And there's no way to make it right? So... I'm getting there. I was born with patella alta, which is where your kneecaps are higher than they should be. So okay. I was kind of at a disadvantage anyway. I get it from my mom. I'm not blaming my mom. It's just the way it goes. So, <laughs> so we threw everything at it. And this was like the last year of my deal. So I'm trying to make sure I cross all my T's, dot my I's, and make sure I'm doing everything I can to try to get back on the court. We tried different tape jobs. We tried all kinds of different things. And... And the training staff was just like, I don't think this is going to work, man. This, your knee is, the kneecap is not where it's supposed to be. So you're just at a mechanical disadvantage. There's too much pain, all these different things. I threw everything out. I was doing, I was running on the Alter G and all I kinds remember. of He's stuff. He's doing everything. Yeah. So I I couldn't get back on the floor. I couldn't get to the point where. And you were I rehabbing what, like 12 hours a day? I mean, yeah, you were icing every time. I mean, you were. I was in the pool, yeah. which if I'm in the pool, you know something's. That's urgent. There's a sense of urgency because <laughs> me and water don't mix. I'm a suspect swimmer. It was basically like torture for me. So we're in the pool doing that. I'm I'm doing boxing and just all kinds of stuff just to kind of keep my conditioning right. It didn't work. It didn't work. And Dan Tony is just like, man, we we got to let you go. We got to let you go. And I was hoping you'd get back, but because I would have days where I looked okay because I was taking pain pills and all kinds of stuff. And then it would just swell up the next day and it would be painful. And there were days where I, I was limping and I couldn't move like I wanted to. And I'm trying to run and do all this stuff. It was bad. It was bad. So they cut me. I went and, and my contract was still guaranteed. So I was still getting paid, which was nice. But so I went to Alabama and had James Andrews, who's a world renowned surgeon and, he he's done a ton of athletes knees and he's ACLs. super innovative ACLs 
And so he actually tied a wire around the top of my kneecap to my femur and pulled my kneecap as far down as he could. He still couldn't get it all the way down because it had been up there so long and my quad was so tight. So he pulled it down as far as he could and tied the wire around it. I'm rehabbing, trying to get back in Alabama, which, you know, it was anyone who's been to Alabama knows. It's not, yeah, it's not, not somewhere where you want to be. If you're there, you're there for a specific reason, and there's a purpose and a mission <laughs> to get out of there as soon as possible. <laughs> is part of the mission. But so I, I was rehabbing there. The wire breaks while I'm rehabbing. Ugh. I didn't even know any some of this. I didn't, you didn't know, know that? that. I didn't know that. While I'm rehabbing, I'm doing my leg extensions. So this is your second surgery. Yeah. That's two years later, surgery. right? Two yeah. or three years later, yeah. you're in Alabama. No, and that was my the wire third breaks. surgery. That was your third surgery. Because my right knee, it was halfway torn. Wow. So they had to go in there and sew that one up. And uh, and that was giving me issues too. So while I'm rehabbing, the wire breaks. We have to go into emergency surgery the next day. And they took the wire out. My kneecap moves up a little more. I continue to rehab. Somehow I get to the point where I can look good on a court for 10 minutes. And Dallas got wind of the fact they thought I was coming back. Because any, any team that would talk to me, I'd be like, yeah, I'm good. I'm coming. I'm, right. I'm getting there. Because you know, you're optimistic and yeah. you really believe that you were. Yeah. yeah. I felt like, okay, yeah, my kneecap isn't the way it's supposed to be. It still hurts really bad, but I can take some leave and go out there and tough get through out. a season. Yeah, I mean, I was just going to try to tough it out. And so the Dallas Mavericks call up and they're like, hey, if you're back to what you were, we'll, we'll come look at you and, and see what's what. So they come in. I take a double dose of pain medicine. <laughs> <laughs> and I get to the point where I'm just flying. Like I look, I look like I did back in 07 with the Warriors. My bounce is crazy. I'm, I'm dunking off of that foot. They put me through this sprint test and I... I had a really good time and and was better than most of the guys on wow. their team. They put me through a shooting drill. I could shoot. That was that was no problem. I think I missed I think I missed one shot out of was it fifty? Wow. So you put on the performance yeah. of a lifetime. Yeah. But it's like five spots, five threes. So yeah, twenty five. So I made I made twenty four out of twenty five threes. They did this thing where they ring the bells, like only Dirk has made this many threes in this in this drill. And then we did this, all these other drills, and I was killing. I was a monster. And so they were like, well, yeah, he's back. He's good. We'll, we'll sign you. We'll give you a two-year deal, right. guaranteed. So I'm like, great. And so I get to Dallas. <laughs> I feel like as soon as I get to Dallas, I start deteriorating slowly but surely. Every day is worse and worse and worse. I actually got in games and, and played well for the most part. And it, they signed me when they, I think it was January they signed me. And so the playoffs came around quick. We got knocked out by the Oklahoma City Thunder. And we're doing workouts after the season. Still getting worse and worse. The training staff is trying everything they right. can. The tape jobs, everything. I'm, I'm going in. I'm going to LA almost every other weekend to get these shots in my knee, like sugar and water and all kinds of stuff they're doing. I did P, was it P PTP or uh, I forget what it's called. The they spin. They did the, injections. Yeah, the they? bone marrow and put that stuff in there. I did all that, and nothing was working because my kneecap just wasn't where it's supposed to be. So finally, Dallas sees the writing on the wall. They trade me to Cleveland, which was the worst thing that could have possibly happened because Byron Scott was there. He's like a drill sergeant. He's like, we're just going to run just for the heck of it, just so I can watch you guys run. There's no reason. This doesn't help us <laughs> get better in basketball. We're just going to run and see, old if, yeah, old see school. if we can make the Navy SEALs. I don't know what he's what his plan was. So we're doing sprints. It gets to a point where it's so bad and my leg goes numb and I couldn't feel my leg. And somehow I still made, I still passed the test. And I was asking one of the bigs, one of my teammates, I was like, how do I look like running? How's my gait? Is it, am I straight? Do I look like I'm, I'm running normal? Can you tell anything's wrong? He's like, bro, I don't even know how you got across the finish line. You're, you're not even picking up your left leg. <laughs> <It's> just <laughs> yeah, you're just dragging it. You look like you're, yeah, you look like there's something really wrong. 
And so after that, they saw the writing on the wall. They let me go. So that was 2013. That was my last season. So you've been traded and cut three times. Yeah. From being like the peak of your career. Twice. Yeah, right. cut twice. Yeah. and Traded twice, cut twice. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was that was a lot. And I was still getting paid for a while because the contract, contract was guaranteed, but they were just like, well, you're not going to make it through the rest of the training camp. Not talk about a season. And so... So they let me go. So yeah, that was that was the end, 2013. And oh yeah, I forgot to uh, talk about the off the court stuff. In 2010, after I got traded to the Knicks, my dad died. So that was that was pretty devastating for our family. We didn't understand why that happened. It's a whole long story. My dad had gone through having a heart transplant. It seemed like he was doing well. All of a sudden, he stopped taking his pills and he passed away. So. That was tough on us as a family, and I'm going through that. I'm trying to rehab and get back. And the great thing about that was we got closer as a family right. during that time. When my dad died, we got cl- closer to the Lord individually as a family. And my dad, one thing he instilled in me was, you know, your identity is not your that you're a basketball player. Right. Playing basketball mm-hmm. is just something you do. You're you're a child of the King. You're a follower of Jesus Christ, and his li- your life is in his hands. So that was my identity. So once basketball left, I was <laughs> upset and devastated, but not like the world is going to end right. and there's nothing I can do. I did feel like when I was playing, I did feel like broadcasting and sports broadcasting and talk shows and color commentating – that stuff did seem attractive to me and I felt like I could do that. I felt like that was something I could do. So after kind of taking a break and just not wanting any parts of the game and just being mad about the fact that my career was probably done, I tried to get back for a little bit. I got some more shots and more operations. I don't know. I don't even know how many operations I've had at this point. Got back in the gym and tried to start playing pickup and all that stuff. And my knee would just swell up and it was painful. And it was just like, there's no point doing this. I, I, should probably just move on because me going and playing pickup and and then coming home and after to be in a, on a game ready and getting treatment and all this stuff is not worth it if I'm not trying to go back so I got into broadcasting and and during that time I was still doing real estate so that was that was going well and I actually went back to so this is before I got into broadcasting I went back to college and got my degree because I told my mom I would and that was in 2015. So, so here's a went former a NBA. Lull. Here's an NBA player just yeah. got done playing on campus at Lexington, Kentucky, yeah. going back to school. Yeah, my my advisor was saying because I had been taking classes while I was in the NBA. I was taking online classes to try to finish. My advisor was saying, "Okay, this last part of your education, you'll have to you'll have to come in." and take classes because they don't offer these advanced classes online. And at first I was like, no, there's no way I'm going on campus. I'm what, how yeah, you were 20, you were 30 maybe. Yeah. I was, I, think you were 30. I was up there. Yeah. yeah. And I just didn't feel like I wanted to be sitting with these younger kids and, and going through that. But somehow he convinced me. I was like, all right, you know, because he was like, okay, just come in six months, just knock it out. And you won't have to deal with this ever again. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to, I told my mom I would finish. And this is the way, it was either that or I had to transfer to to some school out here and take classes on, you know, here and just, it would be a whole terrible process. Was that me? Sorry. I don't think that was me. But so I just decided to go on, go back to campus and, and do the whole college student thing. I got an apartment out there, just hibernated. And it was actually a good experience. I thought I was going to need like a tutor just because I'd been re- just right. so far removed from actually being in college. Was it 10 years? So I thought I was going to need a tutor. Turns out the streets teach you things. And I came back, I was just street smart. I could just figure stuff out. Finance was one of my worst classes when I was actually in school. It was a snooze fest. I would fall asleep <laughs> while the, the lecture is happening and and I just couldn't concentrate. And I went back and I was, other other students were asking me questions, trying to get help from me. Didn't need a tutor, got all A's, made the dean's list. 
and knocked it out in six months and then I was done and then kind of came back after that I was like man I was I crushed that I kind of just did that I didn't even I could do whatever I want so what's after your that, degree in business marketing okay business marketing and it was fun actually it was fun and made some kind of good friends at school even though they were younger we did projects together and all that stuff and it was good it was a good experience how Way humbling better was than that I being like a 30 year old former NBA player multi-millionaire going back sitting in class I mean I I always remember telling you like man I can't believe you're doing that like yeah. I couldn't imagine being where you were at yeah it you was know, I mean I guess it would be humbling but I just I was never like a prideful guy I never looked at myself as someone that's just important or celebrity or whatever you want to say I just never looked at myself that way so going back for me was just I the the thing I was worried about was just being the old guy and looking right looking like you know what is this old guy doing misfit, here yeah yeah, yeah in the back exactly. of the corner yeah. right like, like just what is what is life done to this man that has brought him all the way back here and so that's what I was worried about I wasn't worried about actually going and finishing and being you know there so I got over that pretty fast and I guess I look pretty young, so no one even really noticed that I was that much older. It's, there was a few that that recognized me from back in the yeah. day, but these were, I mean, this is ten years removed, so these kids don't even, right? They don't even remember like five years back what happened with with the the Kentucky. So the Wildcats. thing you were afraid of most didn't even end up right. Happening. It wasn't a problem. Like there wasn't a bunch of kids coming to me. It's like, didn't I watch you back in the day play with the? I mean, it just didn't happen as much. There were there were some old people when I'd go do these events or whatever that would come up and say things, but I didn't care. It wasn't. Yeah. Like, and most people were congratulating me for coming back and actually doing that and and taking the time to to get your degree. And obviously, it was great for UK. They loved it so. It was cool. It was a great experience. I did that and I crushed it. And then I decided, okay, let's let's get back into basketball now. I do miss basketball. I do miss watching. I had been watching games and all that stuff. And I decided to to go into broadcasting and just hit up people I knew. I'd played for the Warriors, so I hit people from the Warriors up. Hit hit up Jim Barnett. He got the ball rolling. Kind of introduced me to 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 Devin over at NBC Sports Bay Area and. The rest is kind of history. I did pre and post game for was it four years? I think. And you pre started out as an half. intern, though. I think that's what's interesting. Is you? No, you, I didn't, it was just I didn't. I didn't. I wasn't doing a full year when right. I got there. I started out. They put me on. Was it like part time? Yeah, it was like maybe half of the games. Half the game. And then once the playoffs came around that first year, they're like, okay, he's, he's good. Let's just put him all the playoff games. And that was that first year was the 2015 2016 year where they won the 73 games. Right. And then they lost, but it was exciting. And we had a great time doing pre and post game. And the next year I was on all the games. So I was full time after that. So, so it was four years of that. And then they, they made me the color commentator and Jim, Which is a big Jim time Barnett, promo- promotion. Yeah, Jim Barnett, when I first talked to him, he was a color commentator. He was like, I think you should take my job. And I was like, I wasn't calling you for that. I was just calling you for advice. This is your domain. Just what do you think? And the first thing he said to me is like, you, I think you're going to take my job. You should take my job. You're well-spoken. I think it'd be perfect for you, all this stuff. And I was like. So do you have to go through like training or what you do to be a broadcast? Because I mean, I've I've seen some, you know, professional athletes. They yeah, actually, they make that transition. I've heard they spend, you know, a year or two going to school, for lack of a better word, but training together. Because that's. So the, the MBPA, the Players Association, put on this training camp if you will it was like a three-day little boot camp broadcasting boot camp they called it sportscaster you and they just put you through the gauntlet we did radio we did color we did we did stand up simulated game in the background we did studio where we're just kind of going back and forth they had us argue with each other they had us give our takes and then all kinds of different scenarios. And they would put us on there. They'd give us a few pointers. And it wasn't like a snooze fest where they'd give us a 30-minute lecture. They would just give us a quick five-minute yeah. few pointers, and it was good, and we'd, they'd throw us back out there. So that was kind of when I really fell in love with broadcasting and all the ins and outs. They, they talked to us about what goes into actually producing a show and the, the nuts and bolts and showing us the studio behind the scenes and all that stuff and the cameras and all the work that goes into it. And then I loved it all. I loved doing color i love the studio stuff i loved radio i love it all so i was like i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do this and i just dove head first into it and 
and it's been a blast ever since. It doesn't feel like work, and that's that's one of the things that I love about it. It's, I was kind of doing it before I even started, where I'm just watching games, and it'd be me and you watching a just game, talking. and we'd be talking, mm-hmm. or it'd be me and my brother watching the game, talking. And now I'm just doing it in front of the camera. So there, you, you go through just making sure you're yourself and and just get to the point where you're comfortable on camera to where you could just do what you do when the camera's off and that that wasn't a really hard process i got used to that pretty quick and it was fun it's it's been fun and this last year was my first year doing the color very eventful season even though there's a lot of losing obviously there's a lot of injuries for the warriors but it's it's a one-year dip they're gonna be back contending next year probably be one of the teams that people are talking about that have a shot to win it all next season, especially if they do a good job when it comes to figuring out what they're going to do with this pick that they have, this this lottery pick. They're probably going to trade it, maybe bring someone else in, hopefully get someone that's disgruntled from another team. Who knows? But it's going to be a fun season next year. So it's it's been a blast, and that's kind of what has taken up most of my time recently. Which is why you like mailbox money, yeah, real estate. Massive, yeah. So I th- a couple things that stood out to me, and that was uh, obviously jam packed with a lot of great, uh, you know, a, a great story and a lot of good lessons. Was you know, no matter how many surges you had, how many setbacks you had, and I remember, I remember living that with you. I mean, just seeing it, and uh, you just never lost hope and lost confidence. I think yeah. no matter how bad things got and how bad the news was, because I mean, for being in the prime of your career, and I think you were 27, 28, having it injury like that is devastating. I mean, some people never recover from that. Yeah. You know? I think, and, yeah. I think it helped that I had great people around me. You know, I had accountability brothers like right. you and, and Corey, my brothers were amazing. I, like I talked about my dad and my family really faith, instilled yeah. in me that my identity is in the Lord Jesus Christ. My faith was the biggest thing thing that kept me sane and kept me from going crazy and going woe is me and all that stuff. I've always been a really positive guy. I like to laugh. I like to have fun. That helped me too. And I was, I was never, I was never at the point where I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't do something with my life. I couldn't go to the next thing. Like I feel like a lot of guys get done and they're just like, they're just in this rut that they can't yeah. get out of. And I was, I've always been the cheapest dude ever. I mean, you know me, I, I don't just spend money like crazy. Saved, yeah. yeah. I never lived really lavish life. I never got a huge house. Even when I was playing in the league, I just, I just saved and I didn't, I never was a jewelry guy. I still can't wear a watch. I mean, my brother, my brother's got me watches. I, Steven Jackson got me this diamond watch and, and, I remember that thing when was I was crazy, playing my yeah. first year, I didn't even like wearing it. I was like, "This is gonna get stolen." What, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't have, yeah, yeah. I don't even look right. Diamond it. studded exactly. everywhere. It was yeah, bling, yeah, yeah. Never been able to buy yeah. jewelry, necklaces, all that stuff. So I, I just, I was never at the point where I was just broke, um, and that helped. And and how I about when you reached to, out to everyone? I thought that was interesting too, because a lot of people that want to get into real estate, you know, hit Chris and I up all the time, and it's like. People got to be willing to, you know, you went back to Kentucky, did what you needed to on the yeah. education side, and then you hit up, I don't know, hundreds of people in the NBA, out of the NBA, oh, yeah. all over to, you know, just get your foot in the door. Like, was, there was nothing you weren't willing to do right. when you knew that's what you, you know, the path you wanted to go. That was another thing, cool thing. The Players Association really takes care of their players, and there's a lot of resources for players. That We went to this this Vegas business conference thing that they would put on every summer, and big time real estate moguls would come in there and you know this one guy he's talking about triple net lease and if you can get into to a walgreens or something like that that's a really good investment if that's what you're about if you you're a stress-free investor and you want passive income you don't want to deal with all the the headaches that come with with owning a building at times if you can get into a triple net lease that's that's huge so they they brought in a lot of guys like that that had kind of been through ending their basketball career and going into something else or had planned during their basketball career and and weren't scared to leave the game because they'd already kind of built what their next career was going to be and 
that was huge for me. So I, I tried to, while I was playing, made sure I saved and did all that and got into real estate in 09 and, and had a pretty solid foundation there. And, and that's why I was able to go back to Kentucky. Cause I could just kind of leave everything the way it was. I had some passive income coming in and could just go and just focus and get my degree for six months and, and come back and, and go into, into broadcasting. So I think the player association definitely helped out and then just kind of reaching out and, and trying to figure out, you know, if there's people that can kind of help me along the way, give me advice and taking advantage of all those resources that you have as a NBA player, or a former NBA player. Now, if people that are listening, uh, you know, wanted to try and connect with you or bring you a deal, what are, what are the things you're looking for in real estate right now that people could reach out and say, Hey, Clint, I think I have this that fits your, fits your box. Like for 2020 and 2021, what, what are the, some things you're looking for that people could keep an eye out for you? Um, I'm definitely, like I said, I'm all about the turnkey. I'm working with this company right now. It's called Marketplace Homes where they'll actually, they'll, if they, if you give them one of your properties to, to, to manage for you, they have property management and then they can go out and, and buy houses for you. They'll actually guarantee rent even when it's not occupied. Wow. Hmm. So that, that's here in Denver. That's they're nationwide. Okay. And if so, if if it's called Marketplace, Marketplace Homes, Marketplace you can Homes, look them up, yeah. Okay. And it's a really good company. So I've I've gotten some properties with them. So basically, you you got to commit to buying another house with them first, hmm. and then they'll do the the rent thing and okay. guarantee that. And they'll property manage all the houses for you and, and just keep going like that. So as an investor, they take care of all that stuff. It's it's turnkey properties. It's all new houses that they buy. They're they're up on the, the new builds and all the new developments. They're in Atlanta. They're all over the place. Mm. So are the properties you're buying with them, are they in Denver or are they out of state? There's there's some that are out of state. Yeah. Um, I don't think they've done any in Denver. Oh, so but, you're buying with them out of state? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at with it right now. I mean, we'll talk more about the the multifamilies. Honestly, I haven't really dove into multifamily. I feel like it's just kind of a, a different arena and I feel like I need to to read up on it more. But obviously you do great work with that and and I just like the the monthly income that comes with buy and hold, rent it out, build that up, build up your portfolio that way. And just hold on to things. So I'm I'm more about holding on to properties now instead of trying to get in low and just turn it around and, and a sell quick right flip, off the yeah. bat. Yeah, done some wholesale stuff with my younger brother, and and he was doing that for a while. Now he's in banking. Zoe's MLO. He's in he's a mortgage loan officer, and he does great work. So anytime I need need him, he's there. But that's kind of where I'm at with it, and. It's I'm slowly getting back into to to real estate and building up that portfolio. Um, people like you have a passion for it. I can't say I have the passion you right. have for real estate. <laughs> this is my full. This is like my broadcasting. That's, your, that's yeah. your full thing. Yeah. And and you're great at it. And you have a team. How I was I was going to ask you how long do you feel like it took you to get into a rhythm with your team? with the team you surrounded yourself with, yeah. contractors you normally work with, the MLOs yeah. and all that stuff. Yeah. It's, um, it's, I it like takes a time. It takes, it. A, yeah. it takes a long time, yeah. It's it's always evolving, you know. Sometimes guys, you know, like even our HVAC guy, like in the last month, he's been, you know, he had to go down to Mexico and I haven't heard from him. And, you know, so you're constantly having to, it's kind of like the NBA, you're constantly having to like trade guys in and out and substitute and bring, and bring in new players. And, uh, you know, it's constantly evolving. Uh, your, our core, you know, CFO, bookkeeper, and, you know, my management team, you know, you got to have key guys that are stable in those positions. But as far as guys out in the field, I mean, it's always, it's just a revolving door. I mean, we try and have like some, some, some consistent core guys, but it's just construction by nature is just such a volatile, transient industry yeah. that's really hard to find guys that you can count on just because that's just not the nature of, of that, that industry, but no, it takes time. I mean, it's taken a lot of time. I mean, you know, I mean, I moved back to Denver in 2014 and that's when I started kind of my own company and 
So it's been six years, dude. So your your investors get in knowing it's like a long term play, and it's you know leave money with us, and we're gonna slowly build this, and we're gonna put you get you equity and properties that are, you know. Yeah, we just started taking outside money this year. From before that, it was just me and my two partners, and we would just invest our own dollars. But this year, yeah, we're just doing investors can invest in individual deals. So we so like a Beeler, for instance, we would we'd write up a pro forma. We'd send it out to a few people and say, here's this deal, and we're going to raise X number of dollars and say $100,000 for this deal. Here's what we're expecting the return will be in this many years. And, you know, as soon as the property's finished with construction, it's cash flowing, then we're making quarterly distributions, you know, to the guys. So kind of like your thing. A lot of our investors are privately wealthy from other industries, and and they're looking for mailbox money as well. And so they're looking to park large amounts of money where they can get quarterly distributions. Yeah. So that Beeler property, you looking to, you were looking to flip that one or did you rent that one out? You flipped it and then let someone else. So we did all the work and it made it a turnkey property. So we renovated yeah. it, we leased it up and then we put it on the mark. We didn't even put it on the market. I think, uh, we, I gave it to the broker. So once it was cash flowing, then they called a couple people. I think someone from out of state ended up buying it for the same reason. They wanted just cash flow okay. and something stable. We had done all the work. We'd put market tenants in there and uh, so that was our own capital. So that was from last year. And yeah, we just, we put in our money, we renovated it, you know, added the value. And then we, we basically sold it, took our profit and went and invested it okay. in another. In so another you're not deal. doing any buying holes in. You're, you're looking to usually flip stuff, get it to where it's turnkey. And then we do a little bit of both. I mean, I'll, if the timing's right, we'll sell it and, and take, take the chips off the table and put it in something else. And then there's other properties that we have that will hold long term and and uh, and cash flow. So we do kind of a blended approach, yeah. but all multi. You know, the yeah. goal is just do all multifamily. Some are shorter term than others. That's what's cool about real estate. There's so many different ways to to do it to skin the cat. I mean, you just got to figure out what your personality is, what works for you, what your investors want, right. what what kind of money you're wanting to make, and how much time, and you know what your team's capable of. All that stuff. It's pretty cool. So I mean, I feel like everybody just kind of find their own lane, figure out what their personality is, what they can tolerate, what how much time they have to actually yep. deal with contractors and 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 all of that stuff because you know, if if you get into something and and you're not willing to to put the effort it takes to to make sure you do the job well and and see it through, things can go bad. And we've learned that. I've learned that, you know, there's deals I've I well, I haven't had too many deals where I've lost money, but there has been a couple where I had to just break even. Which and feels like a loss. Lessons. Yeah, it feels like a loss. And you just feels like a waste of time. It's like, right. what well, I just I did all that just to break even. But it's frustrating, but then you then you learn your lesson and you try to apply it to the next deal and the next deal. So I think the key, like you said, is you know your personality and what yeah, you're looking for, yeah. and then you just stick to that. And I think that's a pretty big lesson for a lot of people out there is knowing what your personality is and what you're looking right. for and right. focusing on that. Yeah, I guess maybe that's why I haven't ventured into to multifamily and tried to, you know, try to tackle that cow because you know i just it's just i it's i've never really done that it's it hasn't been my lane before but it's it's great with real estate like you can diversify and go into different things and there's and, no right or wrong i've got no a right bunch of friends that are you know their investors are a lot older a lot more experienced a lot more properties than i have and you yeah. know they have 30 40 single family homes and condos around town yeah right and people ask well how can we ever trade up to a multifamily? they're like why they all pay cash flow and mm -hmm. it works. I have a property it manager who hands all those or a property manager who hands one building. Yeah, they're like to me, it's all the same. If it ain't broke, don't fix yeah. it. Yeah, or you can just find a team like TJ's or whoever that does does you know multifamily well and yep. throw money at them. There's all kinds of ways to do it, but it's it's an interesting industry industry for sure. And so you know. I, let me ask you this question because this will I think be good for a lot of uh, listeners out there. Just as we uh, wrap up this episode, like. What advice would you give for people that want to get into real estate investing? Like, you know, you've been there, you've done that, you've adapted in your business career, your investing career. Like, what advice would you give for people that want to just, you know, get into investing and make it happen? It's it's what we've said. I think it's figure out what your personality is and, and attack. Do your research. Get a good team around you because there's a lot of moving parts there. Understand what it is you're getting into. And... If it's single family, you got to have a great team, great inspector, know what your budget is, figure out the the price point you're trying to, to tackle, whatever market that is. And real estate is different in 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 every state, you know, and it's the market is different. 
You got to figure out, you either got to know the market or you got to find someone you trust that really knows that market and, and partner with them. I mean, there's so many different ways to do it. Just, I just feel like you just got to know what you're doing because you can make a ton of money in real estate and, and you know that. And so you just have to know what you're doing, know what you're getting into and don't be afraid to learn those lessons along the way. Don't get frustrated if it's something you're passionate about uh, and go from there. That's, that's my advice. But the know your personality part is, is the biggest thing for me, I think, just because you know, I've been through the fix and flip thing and I thought I was kind of that creative guy that loved the transformation and the HGTV type, type of stuff like that. And it's just, it, it doesn't really get me up out of bed. You know what I mean? That's just not, I'm, I'm passionate about a lot of different things and, and that part of real estate is just not one of them. Oh, I know what you mean. I, I did one yeah. fix and flip and I realized yeah. after one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he says I mean, the exact cool. same thing. Right. Yeah. It's cool. Like the end product and all that stuff. But I was like, man, I just, I mean, that was more months than I bargained for. Yeah. But if, if that's your thing, it is rewarding. It's really rewarding. And I've seen, you know, TJ do his thing. I've seen other people go through that process and, and they're just all about the interior design and I'm going to knock this wall out. And it's going to be more of an open house and I'm going to put these colors there. These colors brighten it up. As soon as you walk in, you feel happy and all these different <laughs> things. They know the colors, they know the, the cabinet colors and all those different things. And they're about it. They're about it. And those are the people you probably want to invest with, you know, if they got a, a good team and all that. So, you know, if, if you, you're about to fix and flip, but you don't want to actually be on the ground and be hands on and be dealing with contractors, find someone that does and, and that is enjoying that type of stuff. And it's not work for them and partner with them. But there's so many ways to do it. You just got to figure out what your lane is and go with it. Wonderful. That's good stuff, man. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Yeah. No yeah. Problem. I've enjoyed it, man. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. I got to talk about athletes corner. All right. Yeah. Tell What's us about the, what you're what involved is this? in. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot. About I just, that. I love athletes corner. It's, it's really God's thing. And basically I always felt like I wanted to be in ministry with athletes and help athletes okay. use their platform to, to really push people towards Jesus, show the love of Jesus and encourage families talk about their faith talk about their testimony. You don't have to be imposing when it comes to faith. You can just talk yep. about what God's done for you and share your story, talk about their family. So that's what we focus on. It's, it's, it's a nonprofit organization that's focused on faith and family that works with athletes to, to help and encourage families and help change lives. We're trying to change the conversation. So when it comes to our content, that's what our content is focused on. And then we have the foundation piece where we're the foundation behind the foundation. So we have donors that just want what we want to see athletes use their platform for good, right. to talk about their faith, to, to, to uplift people. Yeah. Because when if you think about it, a lot of people are on social media all day and it's depressing. and So much and negativity and, yeah, and conflict right, right. now. Right, yeah. and mental issues and all that stuff. All those problems can come from, you know, filling your mind with all that stuff and identity issues and all that. So we, we want to change the conversation and make it to where it's positive and it's uplifting and all those different things. So that's the content piece. But then the foundation piece is we're in a position where we can fund athlete projects. So we hmm. come behind athlete foundations and we partner with them. Say if, you know, Tony Finau, who we're going to be working with is, is going to feed families and, and buy 20,000 turkeys. We'll come in and, either fund that or we'll double it and wow. bring 20,000 turkeys in That's ourselves. Cool. That's amazing, man. Yeah, so it's it's really God and it's he's just kind of taken this thing and and done his thing with it and he's just kind of showing off. So and we were in Forbes um and and they wrote a good article about it and yeah, it's it's a pretty cool place to be to be able to come to an athlete and say, Hey, we want to give you money. Right. Is anyone else and saying that to your, you? And support, and support your foundation. And support yeah. your foundation. And a lot of these athletes, if you look at it, they're funding everything themselves with right. their foundation. And yeah. a lot of times it's just run by their brother or their family yeah. member, or their cousin or something like that. We come in, we have the infrastructure, we'll put things in place to make sure it's, it's a well run event, whatever it is we do or a project. And we, we, build those those relationships and those partnerships are are going to be a, a really cool part of what we're doing with athletes corner so 
That's if amazing. people want to find out about that, just go to the website or just Google it. Yeah, it's theathletescorner.org is the website. We're on social media. Just type in The Athletes Corner on Instagram, Twitter. So we're oh, Facebook too. So yeah, we have this series now. We're doing a change of conversation. We have some some, I guess it's kind of podcast style, but we don't really tell the athletes it's a podcast. We're just like let's just ask a few questions, and then they just go on. It's pretty cool. They just because I feel like it's kind of a refreshing thing. We're not coming to them with with the content. First of all, we're saying we want to partner with you and and help your foundation, yeah, help right. you do some good. You want to give back. There's so many athletes that just want to give back and and work in their communities, and and. Um, use their foundation that way. So we want to help them do that and really, really amplify whatever it is they're trying to do through their foundation as long as it's faith and family focused. And then with the content, no one's asking them to talk about their faith. Mm-hmm. If if you see a quote with ESPN, ESPN will take out the faith part and just mm. you know, leave the rest in there. So oh, okay. we want to amplify the faith and family part. That's really what's important yeah. to these athletes that that are about that. Right. And so the conversations we're having, they're talking about their faith and family and then whatever else they want to talk about, just something encouraging. It's been cool. We did that during the, the this pandemic where they just talked about what they've been doing with their families, how they've been spending the time, right? you know, focused on their families and, and, and passing the time that way. So it's been awesome. Been awesome. I'm excited about it. It's kind of scratching that ministry itch I've always had when right. it comes to athletes and, and helping them use their platform for good. It's definitely needed right now with all the everything going on in our country, all the division. I love some of the stuff you guys have been putting out and you're promoting unity and and just encouraging, just an uplifting conversation, you know, like you talked about. So I think that's much needed and something we need to continue to do. Yeah, especially like you're saying with all the the racial stuff, the fight for racial equality. We've, with Athletes Corner, we've been looking at everything from a biblical perspective. I mean, everybody's kind of trying to figure out what the solutions are, or what we can do. And we're just like, what does the Bible say about this? And, and we'll throw scriptures on there. We'll, we'll put athletes up there that have said something that pertain that, that is looking at it from the biblical point of view or what would Jesus do and all those different things. So we're, we're sticking to what we do and it's cool. Anything that comes up in the world, any issues or whatever it is, we can always, go to the Bible and be like, okay, how do we operate from a place of love, not fear, and do it the way the Lord would want us to do it? So it's been cool. All right. Yeah. Well, awesome, man. Well, thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been I good. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Good that conversation. We covered a lot of good ground there. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah.